Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Um, I'm very glad to be here today, and I'd, I'd like, first of all, to thank the Mineral Springs Foundation for asking me to do this. Uh, and I would also very much like to acknowledge the invaluable and necessary help of the Manitou Springs Historical Society and Deborah Harrison. Uh, the pictures that I'll be showing today are all the property of the Manitou Historical Society, um, which by no means coincidentally uh, maintains a facility called Miramont Castle that we're all familiar with, which is uh, a tremendous gallery of photography, vintage photography of Manitou Springs um, going back to the beginning and essentially to the present day and also uh, of graphic renderings of Manitou and many other sources. This first picture was taken by one of the very early photographers in Manitou Springs. His name was James Thurlow. This may not be the first picture taken in Manitou Springs. In fact, uh, somewhere I saw a picture of a creek with bushes all around it and hills in the background that purported to be a picture of the original Manitou Spring, which is where the spa building stands today. There's nothing in the picture to identify it as Manitou Springs, and there's no buildings or people in it. Um, Manitou Springs, of course, is been here since time immemorial. The first mention of it that I'm aware of by more or less by name is by the English explorer and adventurer Ruxton, who was here in the 1840s and who at that time mentions there being people living here around the spring. Um, about the time people began to move here in significant numbers, <coughs> approximately 1870, photography arrived on the scene in the person of Thurlow and at least one other. This picture was taken about 1872 or perhaps 74. It's one of the first commercial establishments in Manitou Springs and it's photography. So I thought this would be an appropriate um, <laughs> picture to start with. Ever since the invention of photography, it's enjoyed immediate and universal acceptance by uh, the public all around the world. <clears throat> in the background of this picture, it's a familiar scene. This would be roughly equivalent to somewhere on, on Manitou Avenue. I'm not too sure how far along. Uh, Pikes Peak is dimly visible in the far background. Uh, eventually, Thurlow's studio became located in what is today the parking lot of the Barker House, between the Barker House and the, uh, the Navajo shop. I don't think, although I could be wrong, this could be that location. There are some reasons to think so based on um, a picture that you'll see later on. That, uh, that's not green. It looks like green color in there. Um, the process involved here, when the picture was taken, Thurlow used um, or made a photograph called an albumin print. And they very often printed, um, they very rarely, I should say, printed as a, as a cold black and white image. Uh, they were uh, sometimes somewhat yellow, uh, somewhat orange, somewhat brown. I've read that they were sometimes somewhat green. They are very old photographs, and as such, they tend to turn yellow and orange over time. Uh, I've taken the liberty on some of these of um, enhancing the contrast because of the, the, the way it's being projected, they tend to disperse and fall apart. And in others, I've also removed a little bit of the yellow cast uh, using software to try to restore how the picture probably looked or closer to how it probably looked as an original. Albumin print was made by um, beating egg whites real fine, spreading them on a glass plate and then sensitizing them with a solution composed primarily of silver nitrate, which is the light sensitive portion of a photograph. There were a million variations on, on that particular process. It's a very old process and was invented in the 1840s by the cousin or nephew of Daguerre's original partner. It stayed in use so well into the 1870s and beyond. <clears throat> One of the interesting things about these photographs from the very oldest to the, to the most recent is the quality of them. They were um, extraordinarily sharp, a tremendous tonal gradation. This is 
the wagon train, which is uh, today Highway 24. Uh, this is dated from between 1874 and 1878. This wagon train uh, was eventually replaced by the paved highway that was eventually replaced by the four-lane highway. It's very, it's very important in the early history of Manitou. This is um, a little uphill up the pass from present-day Rainbow Falls. At the time this picture was taken, there was uh, an awful lot of mining activity going on in the vicinity of Leadville, and a lot of it left by wagon train from, from the Pikes Peak region. This highway had a, a great deal to do with the early development of Manitou Springs. There was enough traffic going up Ute Pass and at this point in history for there to be a need for people uh, providing places for travelers to stay. So the early development of hotels was one of the first things that occurred in Manitou Springs. This is an early view uh, looking down what is now Manitou Avenue. The gazebo-like structure in the center is Navajo Spring where there's uh, now buildings. One of these pictures down here is uh, Thurlow's studio, one of the buildings uh, down the avenue there. This shows better in another picture from about the same time that Thurlow took where the uh, photography sign is visible. Uh, it's not visible in, in this picture. The building on the right, I don't know if it is, uh, I don't know the name of it, it's, a, it's an old hotel and there's another picture from about the same view that shows horses tied up here and people standing around talking. So, there's not a lot of people in a lot of the early photography because there weren't many people here and the exposure times were so long that it was possible for uh, somebody running or a horse running to go through the picture while the picture was being taken and fail to register on the film because uh, the film was that slow back in these days. But if you recall the wagon train picture from a few moments ago, a lot of the people in it uh, may have stayed in the, in the Cliff House. One of the early functions of the Cliff House was to provide lodging for people on their way to the mining fields in Leadville. Here we have the Cliff House. This pair of photographs um, are what are called a stereo pair they were made for, uh, with a camera that had two lenses, it made two exposures, and the, the negative, the glass plate negative that was produced, as were all negatives at the time, were contact printed on the paper. Um, so the, the original size of the photograph was actually the original size of the negative because they didn't have the technology for enlarging at that time. These stereo pairs are slightly offset because they were shot through two different lenses and were viewed by placing them in, in a gadget called the stereopticon, which uh, you looked through and slid the thing back and forth until the picture came into focus, and lo and behold, it was 3D. And I don't know why this is still not popular. At one time, this accounted for most of the photography made for popular consumption was uh, stereo photography through most of the 19th century. The Cliff House has changed this was the original Cliff House. It didn't look like this for very long. I was involved as a photographer with the renovation of the Cliff House, uh, which resulted in the, in the present building. And there are parts of this building in the present building, uh, yeah. some of the beams inside. Cliff House opened, if I'm not mistaken, in 1872. Soon after this picture was taken, a sign appeared uh, up on the top around the widow's walk that said Cliff House. And very soon after it was built, there was another building uh, built off to the right side that, uh, if you're familiar with the um, antebellum South architecture, looks for all the world like slave quarters. Uh, it wasn't, of course. Uh, it was actually uh, today historically referred to as a billiard parlor. And it was built uh, very soon after the Cliff House opened. So this is, this is very early in the history of both Manitou and the Cliff House. The big rock in the, in the foreground, 
is the big rock across the creek from Patsy's. Rock has uh, been here a long, long time. The, the little, <laughs> probably about four billion years. The uh, gazebo-like structure to the left and beyond the rock uh, is the present-day lobby of the spa building. So some of the features of Manitou have been prominent uh, since uh, the very beginning of the town. Now we'll go back to the wagon trail and look from the wagon trail back at Manitou about the time of the building of the Cliff House. These early, earlier pictures go back about 130 years and all the landforms that are, we're used to today are unchanged, except um, by development. Butte Pass has changed more than anything uh, due to the highway construction. Manitou Springs is in the far background here. The building that's beginning to emerge just to the left of center um, is again the Cliff House. The billiard parlor has been built by this time. So you can get a, a feel from this picture of what a little place this was at this time. Although most of the buildings you see down there are on present day Manitou Avenue and are commercial. Until essentially Within our lifetimes, uh, Manitou was sufficiently isolated by, uh, by geography. Uh, at first, you could only travel around by horses or by foot. And, uh, so from early on, Manitou Springs had everything that any city would have. Uh, grocery stores and lawyers' offices, photography studios, and so forth and so on that we don't have anymore. Um, and that's uh, due to changes in transportation more than anything. It's, it's, this is a very faint picture, even in the original, but it, it's a good, um, good overview, uh, nonetheless. Was this 72 also? This, uh, the dating on um, all of these early Thurlow pictures um, is 1874 to 1878, uh, and I can't tell you anything about um, the research that went into that, although it's known that those are uh, Thurlow's years here. There is some reason to believe that he got here in 72 as opposed to 74. Is this a photograph, was it made for aesthetic value or was it made for history? Um, it was a distinction that was not always made at this point in time. Uh, pictorially, uh, photography's earliest influence was painting. And if you look at uh, scenic photography, including this picture. Um, Yes, it is, uh, just in terms of a selection of point of view and the composition of it. Yeah. Uh, and that's, um, that's very deliberate on, on the part of the photographer and um, is the, the way they thought. Uh, a great many of the early photographers were trained as painters. And this is the pictorial background they brought to photography. And it shows in a lot of photography. If you notice the rounded corners of this one, this is a single picture from a stereo pair. And this is one, uh, one instance of a landform that's probably not here any longer, having been replaced by a lot of paved highways. This is um, from approximately Spencer Avenue, overlooking Canyon Avenue and the Cliff House, and with a couple of little kids in the foreground, dressed um, as if uh, like Tom Sawyer would have dressed. <laughs> this is a charming picture. You notice, uh, see the guy in the background uh, standing there. I don't. Uh, at first, I thought he was talking to somebody. There may be a child uh, at his feet. The, this picture indicates a, a couple of things about the old photographic processes. You can see how large I've enlarged this, and it's still holding together quite well, and continues to reveal more and more detail. And the little kid on the right, as I heard, he probably moved his head during the exposure. Um, I'm sure elsewhere in the picture, if there's any breeze at all, there'll be um, movement in the bushes and so forth. There's Manitou Avenue in the background. But the only building in this picture that still exists is, uh, is the Cliff House. We're facing south? We're facing south in this? Yes. Yes. The, 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 yeah, the street and the foreground beyond the children uh, is Canyon Avenue. And 
the buildings, uh, the farthest buildings you can see from there would be on Manitou Avenue. I don't know what that street was called back then. I'm sure it wasn't called Manitou Avenue. Is this structure, was this structure incorporated into the new, uh, the newer, because it's so much larger now? Or did they completely tear this down, or? Uh, no, they just kept uh, adding, they oh, added right. stories to it, and they added the, um, the whole wing to the east. And at one point, it actually ran, um, if you see where the next building up Canyon Avenue is from the Cliff House, the uh, Cliff House at one time built a wing running up Canyon Avenue beyond the location of their present day parking garage. Um, and it, it uh, culminated in a tower like uh, the other wings of the Cliff House do. That wing was largely destroyed by a flood uh, sometime around the turn of the century, which is, um, the floods down Canyon Avenue here have a long history in town, and this is another uh, stereo pair and another Thurlow. This is um, described as being shot from the observatory of the Cliff House, which uh, I, I take it on faith is, is what it is. It's looking west toward Pikes Peak. The, um, the big cleft in the hillside you see up there is Engelman Canyon, uh, Ruxton Avenue today. I don't know what the building of the foreground would have been. Uh, from other pictures, I believe it's the roof of the Cliff House, which would indicate to me the picture was actually taken from the hill behind the Cliff House, which uh, they may have had an observatory there of some kind. So it's hard to say, but th this just simply shows the, the western end of Manitou Avenue from roughly downtown. It illustrates the fact that it was uh, developed later than the eastern part of town. There's really only the one house there. This again is from um, probably no later than about 1878. See that there's a cow. You <laughs> keep the cows out of the yard, sure. <laughs> I think the zoning regulations were a little different then. <laughs> The man who's regarded as the founder of Manitou Springs was a friend of uh, General Palmer's <coughs> named William Bell, who built Briarhurst, and who originally um, named Manitou Springs uh, a French phrase meaning a uh, boiling fountain that a friend of his objected to very, very strongly and suggested instead that the town be named Manitou, which uh, is a word that he encountered from reading Song of Hiawatha by Longfellow as Bell reluctantly <coughs> went along with the name change. And at some point around the turn of the century when Manitou uh, became an official city, the, the name officially changed <coughs> from Manitou to Manitou Springs. Uh, Bell built this hotel, the Mansions Hotel. It was very popular at the time it was built. Is any part of that here today? Um, I don't think so. The, there's, a, there's a park behind City Hall called uh, Mansions Park. There's a pavilion there and a garden. And that is the site of the, um, the original Mansions Hotel that Bell built. The uh, kind of glossy appearance in the foreground is um, one of the typical results of deterioration of old photographs also. It's very typical architecture of the period. If you notice all the chimneys, so there would have been a wood-burning heat stove or perhaps a coal-burning heat stove in every room in the hotel. Every one of those chimneys would have run through all the floors of the hotel and had openings, flue openings, in each of the rooms. I wonder they burned. Yeah. 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 The creek is like right in front of this. That's like sitting right on this creek. Yes, it would have been. I believe they see kind of a line running along the front there. I think that's the embankment of the creek. Stoves as opposed to fireplaces? Uh, not necessarily, uh, fireplaces or stoves. I, I imagine, well, I'm sure from, uh, from examining the cliff house that um, some of the chimneys that ran through the cliff house uh, supported stoves and guest rooms and wound up in uh, formal rooms on the ground floor where there were formal fireplaces. But Bell, um, Bell invested an awful lot of energy in promoting Manitou Springs uh, all around the world, actually, and, and Manitou Springs, uh, within 10 years of Bell's founding the town, 
had become a very important uh, vacation destination nationally. Um, you could read about Manitou Springs and buy train tickets in, in New York City and uh, anywhere and get here and people would have known where you were going. This is another uh, panoramic view. The Mansions Hotel is now in the, um, in the right foreground. The shape of Manitou Avenue is beginning to uh, appear as it would eventually come. The, the Mansions Hotel is the only building in this picture that, that I can identify. Um, that might be Thurlow's studio. This, uh, this is another uh, Thurlow photograph. Do you have any idea where the rocks in the foreground are located? Uh, yes, I do. Do you know, um, as you go up uh, Washington Street behind Memorial Park to get to Highway 24, there's a, you can turn right and go up that hillside. Um, I forget the name of the street. It's a, there's a dirt road that goes up there that has a few houses along it. And that is where those rocks are. I think um, the photographer may have been standing on what is now a road. Uh, Burns Road, I think, uh, is the name of it. Yeah. Highway 24 would be to your right and above. The uh, canyon you see beginning in the right foreground and going up uh, the left side, uh, that would be where Ruxin and uh, Ruxin Creek are today. Manitou is still at this time uh, very small, uh, still just kind of creeping along, growing slowly, uh, adding mainly hotels. This is, um, this is Lover's Lane, the original Lover's Lane. And it's a, uh, it looks like a lover's lane. So. <clears throat> this was photographed by Thurlow, so it would have been uh, prior to 1880 in all likelihood. There was a lot of ornamental architecture for th things like buildings around uh, fountains and spas and uh, things like lover's lane, pavilions that were built out of uh, what looked like tree branches. It was sometimes referred to as the Chautauqua architectural style. And uh, this is uh, actually predates the classic period of Chautauqua architecture, but it um, reflects it pretty strongly anyway. Another stereo pair. Among the people who came to Manitou in the early days, who was eventually a lot more famous as the photographer William Henry Jackson, who produced a, a lot of the great classic landscape photography of the American West. Uh, he accompanied the Powell Expedition and others. He was employed by the government for a lot of his career. And he photographed Bell's house. This is, I believe, what is referred to as the second Briarhurst which looks a lot like the present day Briarhurst. The Briarhurst has gone through uh, a few changes in metamorphosis, and my impression is that a lot of the original buildings survived, survived the at least one fire that uh, burned it down during its history. This building bears a lot of resemblance to the present day Briarhurst. This is where uh, William Bell lived. But if you look very carefully at the, the objects in the picture on the left and the right margins of each of the two pairs, you can see that the lenses are offset uh, and, and the, the exposure is slightly different between the two pairs, which is typical of um, stereo photography. The next picture is taken by um, a photographer who has become pretty well known regionally. He wasn't, I don't know how well known he was at the time. This is a William Hook picture of Williams Canyon. William Hook, who uh, lived in Manitou Springs for a great many years, I lived up, uh, up the valley of Ruxton Creek, an area, a place called Artist Glen. He was somewhat forcibly displaced by the railroad that goes up Pikes Peak. But he made a good living uh, photographing Manitou Springs, uh, having the pictures hand colored and turned into postcards. He um, was active during the time when a process called photolithography became possible. <clears throat> and he capitalized on it pretty well. He was a very good photographer also. The path in the bottom uh, follows the course eventually to be followed by the Williams Canyon Road. 
And this picture appears to be taken from pretty near the buildings up on the, at the Cave of the Winds now, from looking down that way. You can have the same view today. Yes, you can, very much, and it would look a, a great deal the same way. There's buildings in the bottom here that uh, are not there today. They're gone. But, um, That's right. But in terms of the, what the canyon looks like, it's how it looks today. Scenery such as this and the location of the caves um, and the springs, of course, which were so very important, were among the things that Bell promoted uh, very vigorously to make Manitou Springs prosper. This is Rainbow Falls. Manitou's Rainbow Falls, not the, not the other one. This is another Jackson photograph. This was a real popular um, destination for people in town. Well, where is that? Uh, it is underneath the Highway 24 overpass. If you go down Serpentine Drive to access Highway 24, right where it makes the hairpin, there's a little uh, dirt area that looks like a small parking lot. And if you park your car there and walk up uh, uh, the path that you'll see and keep walking, you'll come to this. Um, and you'll be standing underneath the overpass and in a very uh, industrial and heavily graffitied setting. <laughs> and in that context, it's uh, probably worth pointing out that uh, Rainbow Falls is actually located in unincorporated El Paso County, and the graffiti is not underneath Manitou Springs jurisdiction. <laughs> There's uh, four women and a man here, and that's what the caption to this picture uh, says as well. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's all I know about it. Uh, it. It was again taken by Jackson, which uh, dates it a little bit. This again was the sort of thing that um, Bell would have promoted. Now we're gonna <clears throat> show another photographer. Uh, uh, this picture is taken from area called the Narrows and what's known as the Williams Canyon Road. And I put it in here because it's a, a place we've probably all seen at one time or another. If you go all the way up Canyon Avenue, um, you then encounter the Williams Canyon Road and it goes through this very narrow cleft in the canyon. But if you look behind this individual, that's debris from a flood that happened the year the picture was taken. This was taken uh, in 1882. There was actually a fatality in uh, this particular flood. The Native American presence in Manitou Springs has always been uh, central to how the town has been used. Uh, Ruxton in 1840 talks about um, the spring being decorated by the uh, ritual offerings of the native people who visited here, and there's a lot of uh, lore from the native people about Manitou Springs, and uh, from early on, Native Americans or American Indians, I guess both are, are used in the native community, have uh, been one of the attractions promoted by the entrepreneurs in Manitou Springs since the very beginning. This is a picture of um, Several Ute chiefs, Ure is uh, in the center. Ure lived a long time. Uh, his wife was Uinta, uh, who the avenue is named after. His principal wife, he had several wives. Um, that's, that's he there. Next to him is Buckskin Charlie, who became a uh, own person locally. Uh, I'm not entirely sure why. This picture was taken by Thurlow, but um, I, my own belief is it was taken later than 1878, just from uh, what little I know of uh, Ure, but it may have been taken uh, about that early. They were always a presence here and were uh, utilized uh, economically from early on as entertainers and just part of the overall lore of the city. Manitou Springs began to grow rapidly. The two people in the picture are the Gillis brothers, who are the builders of Miramont Castle, and many of the colossal, uh, beautiful Victorian stone structures that still stand in Manitou Springs. This next picture is are Archie and Angus and their, uh, their wives and their, and their children, and I 
put them in here mainly because it's also a very good family portrait from the period. It's a good example of period photography. Here's the Gillis family. A pretty faded picture. It's a This was taken some years after the first picture, because I, I believe that's the older brother there who's on the right-hand side on the other picture. And the kids all look happy and well-fed. You know, it's a nice-looking family grouping. And if you look at the house in the background, uh, I guess that house is still there. 106 Ruxton. Manitou Springs owes a lot to the Gillis brothers. They were apparently responsible for a lot of um, what today we would consider architectural design. Their buildings are very distinctive in, in how they were built and what they look like, the kind of features they have. And they're all in, in, uh, extraordinarily labor intensive. This is described as the second bathhouse. Um, this was located where the Canyon Avenue parking lot is today. And it looks a whole lot like the bottling plant that was eventually built to the left of it. Cliff House in the background. The bridge in the foreground crosses the creek. Uh, the creek still follows that very same path, and there's a bridge, uh, more or less, where that bridge is. It leads up to a utility building of some kind. The springs have been such an important part of Manitou from day one. Uh, this was one of the early real developments of that. This I just put in. Uh, for no particularly good reason. This is a kitchen staff at the Cliff House in the mid-1800s. All of these pictures uh, I'm showing uh, during this time are from the late 1800s, which was sort of a high classic period in Manitou, I guess, the period of uh, great growth and development. These are, these are young people. There's no doubt about what they do for a living. <laughs> uh, just to help you orient uh, what you're seeing here, this is taken, uh, if you know where the, the sort of ceremonial stairway is on Manitou Avenue that leads um, up to the Van Horn uh, Cottage area. This would be taken from uh, roughly that vantage point. The, the big rock is the big rock um, at Patsy's, uh, on the other side of the creek from Patsy's. The cliff house is just beyond view to the, to the right. This building is Wheeler's House Windermere, which is on the side of the present day post office, and also on the side of the present day Wheeler House Motel. This is uh, from the late 1880s, and look at all the power lines. I, I'm sure at this point in time there was one telephone line per telephone. <laughs> this next picture is um, pretty much the same view taken from 180 degrees looking back toward the point of view of the picture you just saw. And between the two they show a lot of the development of town in the late, late 1880s. Uh, the Cliff House is in this picture. Just to help you orient, it's um, at the extreme, about a third of the way up on along the left edge. It has towers by this time. There's uh, Johnny Nolan's livery stable. And that's the Barker House. The cut in the face of the hillside up here is the Midland Railroad. Which is right above the school, right? Yes, yes, right above the school. The town's very much beginning to take shape by this time. Let's see what, what else we can make sense out of here. The livery shows up. The livery was apparently around for about 20 years, as near as I can tell. Um, Barker House has not yet got its towers. There's the houses on Duclo, many, if not most of which, are still there. The houses in the foreground are on Grand Avenue. Uh, for those of you that have uh, computer technology at home, uh, uh, 
scanners and Photoshop or similar uh, software. I found that for projecting these pictures in particular, um, it was useful, uh, if not necessary, to enhance the contrast a little bit, um, for the most part using the automatic contrast controls in the software, just so that they would uh, not become too faint when they projected. This is the Barker House. This is probably a, a good bit earlier than the, than the picture we saw right before this, uh, where the Barker House was also present. But it's a very good rendering of the original Barker House. People, uh, people's casual dress back at this point in time was so much more formal than, uh, <laughs> than ours today. <laughs> I'm going to fairly quickly show pictures of two houses here that um, located on Grand Avenue, um, roughly 1890. Very typical of some of the, the grand architecture in Manitou that was becoming very prevalent at that time. I don't know who built this house. Uh, this is known as the Charlton House, although it was lived in by somebody named um, Kuzman, M.L. Kuzman. That was one of the houses on Grand Avenue that was uh, typical, as is the next one here. This was known as the Hilbert House. It was uh, eventually purchased by the Nichols family who owned the Cliff House. And they renamed it. I, I don't offhand recall, but they, uh, it was fashionable to name your houses uh, at the time. Uh, and this house acquired its own name. This. Um, would seem to me to be located where the, right across from the post office where the house with the tower is located now. And I say that because of this hill, and it looks like there's a street here, um, which would be Canyon Avenue, because this house is on Grand, and this, that would be the only corner that I think, um, because of this hill, uh, leads me to believe that this house was located right across from the post office. And we will uh, very shortly here be leaving the period from Roughly 1885 to 95. Yeah, your your house is just to the left of this picture, just barely off the off the screen. But it's still a pretty familiar scene. Everything is kind of in place. So a lot of these buildings uh, were eventually replaced. There's a hotel down here called the Avenue Hotel. There's um. There's the Wheeler block already in place, which leads me to believe that the uh, statue, the Hygieia, the town clock, is uh, probably here too, and is more or less the vantage point of the photograph. Yeah, yeah, I've seen there's a telephone pole there. Right yeah, the telephone pole is uh, still there. <laughs> I, I don't know that to be the case, but it, it very well could be. Um, is it? I wouldn't be at all surprised. This is a very contemporary telephone pole. It's got, it's got uh, signs on it, posters on it. And it's got the metal, it's got the metal rungs that the people use to climb the telephone poles. Telephone poles haven't changed. This next picture is um, maybe a little more recent, but not much than the one that's uh, being replaced. But if the photographer of the picture we just saw jumped way up in the air and turned around and, t and went click, he would have taken this picture. This is a very, um, very familiar picture. I'm sure we've all seen it um, many, many times. It's been reproduced um, a lot. And I've seen it used in a variety of contexts around town. And your, your building is right there, Rocky. Yeah, yeah. And there's the town clock. This building is the former bottling plant that sits where the GM property is. Um, at this time, the, the bathhouse is, uh, is still there. There are no cars. There is an absolute, and if you see this picture in real life, uh, or see it reproduced better than this, there, there's just an absolute jungle of overhead wires, far more than we have today. Uh, it would have to have been taken uh, from a utility pole or from a, a building across the street. This, this would be more or less, uh, I'm trying to think the name of the little street, place where Valhalla gift shop is now. That would be 
pretty close to the vantage point. The next building to the east of there, Oto. 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 Yeah. Uh, then there's the corner of Oto is, is the the Valhalla antique shop, and then the next building down from that is quite a bit taller, and at one time housed an opera house. <coughs> and then that is probably the roof from. I don't know what else it could have been taken from. This is a good picture of old downtown. The next picture I chose uh, primarily because I'm a photographer. <laughs> At this point, we say goodbye to 19th century Manitou uh, in this presentation. I spent a lot of time on the period from 1895 to roughly 1900 because that seems to be the target period for uh, what uh, most people seem to want the town to look like. The building, the large building in the background here is the, um, is the Barker House. This is Thurlow's studio. It's uh, in the, what is now the parking lot next to the uh, Barker House on Manitou Avenue. A little bitty parking lot between the Barker House and the Navajo shop. By this time, uh, Thurlow is long gone. In fact, at this time, uh, I, can, I can tell you, the building had an interesting history. It began as Thurlow's studio. Um, it then be a uh, hook worked out of this building at one time. This is Gerke. Gerke. Yeah. In fact, this may have been taken, this, this, uh, it was Gerke's at this time, as it says up here on the side of the building. I mentioned earlier that photography, from the moment it was invented, was just immediately accepted by the public. Um, between about 1880 and 1900, when this picture uh, was taken, photography became accessible to ordinary people uh, because of uh, Kodak, uh, George Eastman's in invention of uh, a simple, cheap camera and uh, affordable processing. And cameras at that time were called Kodaks. Kodak, the word Kodak was like the word Kleenex today. And that's what that sign indicates. And that's why it's Kodaks with an S on the end of it, plural. It basically means cameras for sale here. But essentially, all of the photographers who historically became associated with Manitou Springs at one time or another used Thurlow's old building as their studio. This is a sliding panel here that they could uh, move back and forth to let in the uh, sunlight. It has a northern exposure, which means that for most of the year, it would have had nice, bright, diffuse light, which is just wonderful for um, virtually any photographic purpose. Uh, photographic printing at this time was uh, done by sun-illuminated con contact printing for the most part, and that also would have been facilitated by the sliding panel. Next is a picture of the Cave of the Winds from the 1920s. Cave of the Winds and uh, Manitou Grand Cavern and uh, another one whose name uh, escapes me right now were uh, major attractions uh, from roughly 1880 forward. This is from the early 1920s, as evidenced by the cars. Wonderful Cave of the Winds. So the, t the town today is reliant on a lot of the same things that it was then in terms of its income from the outside world. Water and our natural attractions. This is Chief Manitou. Chief Manitou's name was Pedro Cajete. He was a Santa Clara Indian from the Santa Clara Pueblo. He eventually returned there and became elected uh, governor of the Pueblo and was one of its spiritual leaders. He's an ancestor of the Native Americans who still perform in Manitou Springs. The Tafoya and Little Deer families uh, are related to this man. Uh, he is also the subject of a recent biography written by a man named Robert Cronk um, through his publishing company and monument. It's a very well done and authoritative book about um, about Chief Manitou in this period in uh, not just Manitou's but the region's history from, with particular emphasis on tourism. Manitou is a French version of an Algonquian word meaning um, great or underlying spirit. And it was um, picked up by Longfellow. <laughs> the word was in use before Longfellow used it in the Song of Hiawatha. Uh, it's used by Ruxton. Um, so 
And there was another, um, there was a, a late Spanish explorer of the Southwest who was not associated with the Spanish Empire, but was a Spanish man uh, who also used the word and who became called uh, the Manitou by a lot of people because some people thought he had evil magical powers. And the people in question who spoke that language migrated uh, west about the time the, the French and the English became a serious presence in the east, the northeast, and uh, displaced a lot of people, which is why we have uh, the Sioux Indians who are immediate north. They began in the woodlands of, of the area around Minnesota and may very well have brought the word with them. This is the bridge that's located at City Hall next to the, um, the antique Cog railway train. And there's a pavilion in, uh, in Mansions Park behind it there. Apparently, uh, outdoor concerts were pretty popular if you look at all the seating there in front of the pavilion. Please and please keep order while band is playing. Um, <laughs> among the information that accompanied this photograph is the fact that the bridge cost uh, an astonishing amount of money to build, $2,297.85. Today we couldn't build it, <laughs> but the bridge is still there. It's built entirely of stone except for a, a concrete footer three feet below the level of the stream, according to the information that accompanied it. The bridge was built in 1919. And here's the arcade. I don't know when the arcade was built. This is the back of the bottling plant. The, the picture says, uh, the, or the documentation with it says about 1930, but I think 1925 to 1930 would probably um, look more accurate based on the cars. The arcade hasn't changed a bit. No. Uh, the bottling plant's gone. Were they bottling the bottom water? Yes, they did, and it was uh, sold all over the country. <clears throat> but, but all these spots in the sky in this picture, when I first glanced at this picture, I thought it was, um, I thought it were dust spots on the picture, but these are actually uh, holding up the, the trolley lines, and you can see the trolley tracks in the street. This is a picture from the 1930s. This uh, is the Stratton Spring in front of what is now the, and what was at this time also, uh, the Loop. The restored spring looks an awful lot like uh, this, this particular spring. But all the buildings in that picture are still there. Uh, they've changed names. That scene looks an awful lot today like it did then. Yeah. It illustrates, among other things, that the historic restoration that's been done of the springs and on a lot of other structures in town has been well researched and is uh, actually pretty accurate in terms of what was there first or originally. This is, you know, from I'm sure the late 1930s. The picture says CA the 30s, but looking at the cars, um, this could have been taken during World War II. Uh, these two guys over here are uniformed military people. And notice the sign, visit the wonderful Cave of the Winds. There's a sign over here that says the Loop Cafe. So Manitou Springs is pretty much assumed its appearance by, the, by, by 1940. Seven Minute Spring, where the present gazebo is, was a commercial establishment for many years that um, I gather from the photographs I've seen of it had a, a very uneven history. This picture is from the 40s. And uh, it's, it's pretty dilapidated. If you look back in here, it's all boarded up. It's obviously not open for business and hasn't been for quite a while. But it was a, a, a commercial thing. There's a picture from the 50s that shows it open with cars parked in front of it and signed advertising ice cream cones and, and so forth. So it's not always been a city park. And this picture brings us uh, entirely too up to date. It's also the last picture in the show. So, it's the lobby of the spa building. The sign over here describes uh, 
Oh, right above the spring. That I don't know. Uh, the sign on the left describes the contents of, man of the water in the spring. The original Manitou Soda Spring. Uh, which it is, uh, which it is. According to um, the Englishman Ruxton in the 1840s, this spring when he got here was a large mineral bowl, uh, the mineral bowl being made by the mineral content of the spring, and uh, was just a, a very popular place. This glass bowl that you see in closing the water was a source of a lot of wrath uh, for many years by a lot of people that thought that um, the spirit of the spring had been captured and, and, and put in here, and that bad luck would haunt this building forever on account of that, and that you can't argue with that based on the subsequent history of the building. One of the interesting things to me about this picture is the, the large number of these containers, vertical container for, I guess, cups right there, so either somebody was real optimistic or it had a lot of visitation. Um, below the floor of this building, there is a body of water, which uh, I have seen with my own eyes. Uh, legend has it uh, that it, it extends over below the cliff house and was one time a shared pool. <coughs> uh, I have no idea. <coughs> I can't find any history of that, or uh, all the history I've tried to find is verbal from uh, longtime residents. And, no one knows what the water under the spa building is, but it's there and it's got stone walls surrounding it. They had tubs and stuff upstairs, didn't they? Excuse me? Didn't they have tubs and stuff upstairs? Yes, they did. In fact, when I moved here in 1981, there was a, uh, a commercial spa activity on the second floor that was, uh, was very excellent, uh, very professionally done, very well done, um, and, and very in keeping with the town's history and hopefully its future. And that, that, that concludes the uh, presentation. Thank you.